So the next pattern we're going to talk about is something called the bridge pattern. And we're going to start off as, as is our convention by showing how we can apply this pattern concretely in the context of our expression tree. And we're going to use this pattern in order to make it easy to write programs that access the capabilities of the expression tree without getting wrapped up in the implementation details of how the composite is implemented. So the way to think about this is we're going to come up with a use of the bridge pattern to have a common abstraction or a common API that can be used to encapsulate multiple representations. And I'll, I'll motivate in a second why you would want to do this. But the key point here is we want to be able to have a common API that clients can program against that will not change. And then we can make it possible to change the implementation of that API in a way that's transparent to the client. So in other words, things can evolve without breaking existing code. And at a high level, the, the benefit of this is that using the bridge pattern will decouple clients, which are things that use these abstractions, the abstractions themselves, the APIs, and the implementations of those APIs. And all those things can vary in cool ways, but we don't have to rewrite the code. So another common theme, don't break stuff that already is there. Very common theme in, in, pattern, uh, in patterndom. So let's talk about some examples where this might be useful. So we might want our expression tree app to run in a range of design time and runtime environments. For example, we might want it to run in mobile devices like a, a smartphone or a tablet or a, a wearable like a watch or a, a ring or something or Google glasses or whatever it is that have very limited memory and processing power. So we need to make certain trade-offs, certain decisions to optimize time for space probably, be more space conserving. Conversely, there are also other contexts, other runtime environments like laptops, desktops, even servers or cloud environments that have abundant resources. So in those contexts, we might want to be more space consumptive if we can make things run faster or run more scalably. So the point is there's, there's no one size fits all solution. And trying to do a one size fits all solution has a lot of drawbacks. Um, one thing is you end up with suboptimal implementations for a given context. So if you're in an environment where, say, you're, you have um, you know, lots of memory, but, you, um, but you've tightly coupled yourself to a solution that's inefficient, that's undesirable. There might be another situation where you have less memory, but you want to be able to run in a way that will be you know, maybe a little slower, but it'll take up less space. Whatever the trade-offs are, you want to be able to switch back and forth seamlessly without breaking the client code. And if we write code like I'm showing you here, where we're hard coding our implementation detail into the client code itself, we have quickly failed our test of being able to be retargetable and um, moving to a new context without breaking what's already there. So the long and the short of it is we want to be able to change the implementations without breaking any client code. Another thing we want to be able to do, which, which at first glance seems the same thing, but it's actually a different thing, is we want to be able to change the service we're offering transparently as well. So we might want to keep the implementation the same, but change the way we bundle it together into a service. So some examples of this is we might want to be able to transparently add instrumentation so every time you do an operation on an expression tree, it automatically logs that in some kind of a logging system. Likewise, we might also want to be able to transparently add synchronization. So if we happen to use our expression tree in multiple threads, we don't want its internal data structures to be corrupted when accessed from multiple threads. So those are examples of where you're changing the service in some ways to be an instrumented expression tree or a synchronized expression tree. We don't really have to change the implementation. We could, use, we could use the composite pattern, we could use some other pattern, but we wanna change the behavior of the service that's exposed to the client. So once again, we wanna be able to change something without breaking the, what we've already done. So how do we do that? Well, what we're gonna do is we're going to encapsulate all this variability, changes in service, changes in implementation, behind a stable API, 
that is going to allow extensibility from something called an abstraction, which is kind of a weird name because everything's an abstraction, but that's what they called it in the Gang of Four bridge pattern. The abstraction is basically the API that's used by the client. And we want that to be really stable, meaning we don't change the methods it defines. And then what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to come along and selectively subclass or refine the abstraction to make a synchronized abstraction or an instrumented abstraction. And we also want to be able to come along and change the underlying implementation that's used to do the actual work. And we're going to be able to change both of those things independently. So we want to be able to have variation in expression tree implementations, one approach using the composite, one approach using a different model. And we want to be able to have variations in the service or services that's provided by an expression tree. And if we can pull this off, we've reached the holy grail of extensible software that's got a common interface that can be extended without breaking what's already there. So the way this works under the hood is we have a reference or a pointer from the abstraction, which is the part on the left-hand side, a thing called the expression tree. And that goes ahead and forwards to the corresponding implementer subclass object on the right-hand side. So when anybody calls a method that's part of the API on the abstraction, like the accept method on our expression tree, that doesn't do any work. It just forwards to the appropriate accept method that's configured into the hierarchy that's on the right-hand side. So that's why this is called the bridge pattern. There's basically a bridge between the abstraction on the left and the appropriate implementation on the right. And then we want to be able to do things like subclass, the abstraction class to enable different services without affecting the implementer hierarchy. So here's how we could make a synchronized expression tree. We might want to make an instrumented expression tree. None of that changes anything on the right-hand side. And then likewise, we want to be able to plug in different right-hand sides. So how the heck are we going to pull all this off? Well, we're going to define a class, which we call the expression tree class. And this is the API. This is the interface of the expression tree class. And the expression tree is the abstraction in the bridge pattern. And what it does is it shields the clients from all the implementation details in the implementer hierarchy, which is on the right-hand side of all this. And those hierarchies can change at runtime or at uh, you know, compile time, design time, and so on without breaking client code. Now, this particular pattern is useful in its own right, but it's even more useful when we look at it in the context of other patterns like factory method, iterator, visitor, composite, and so on and so forth. So we've already talked about composite, and this, in fact, is going to encapsulate a composite, as we'll see in a second. But we also want to be aware, as a foreshadowing of coming attractions, how it's going to be used as part of other patterns. And this concept of multiple patterns working together is a very powerful concept in, in pattern, uh, pattern philosophy, if you will. Here's the constructor for the expression tree class. You can see that it's given a pointer to a component node. So this is the root of an implementer hierarchy. And that's going to get passed in, and then it's going to get held by a, a, a rough-counted uh, smart pointer internally, which we'll talk about later. That's how we connect the abstraction, the expression tree, with a composite, which we built through some other means. We then have a way to forward the methods from called by the client onto the appropriate composite methods, and that's these four methods here, is null, item, left, and right. And you'll notice that they completely abstract away from the details of what the component hierarchy looks like, the component node hierarchy from the composite pattern. We have a method called accept, which plays a very essential role in the upcoming visitor pattern. And it's also used in conjunction with an iterator. And so we're going to be able to iterate through every element in our expression tree, which corresponds to the component node it encapsulates, and visit it. And the visit operation, of course, will allow us to be able to extensively add new computations on our expression tree without actually exposing the details of how that works. And by very carefully decoupling the structure of the expression tree from the operations that we're going to be passing to it through our visitors. 
that that may be a bit abstract. We'll, we'll cover it, of course, when we get to those patterns here shortly. And then the last things we've got here are a couple of factor methods that make iterators. And you can see these look very much like your iterators that we've seen thus far in STL with one little difference. These take const string refs to indicate the traversal order that they want, be it in order, post order, level order, um, and so on. And so notice how we're, we're using the iterator pattern. We're using similar methods that are already defined in STL, but we're tweaking the signature of them ever so slightly to make them more configurable to be able to work with different traversal orders. And that will become clear. Those choices will become clear later when we talk about things like the strategy pattern and so on. So factory method, iterator, strategy, those patterns are part of what we're showing here, but we haven't gotten to them quite yet. So that's kind of a forward reference to those topics. So taking a step back, looking at all this fun stuff from a commonality and variability point of view, you can see here that we've got a common interface. This is the abstraction, which has the methods I show on this slide. And then we can provide variability in a very stylized and controlled and uniform way by plugging in different expression tree um, realizations, representations through the component node pointer passed into the constructor of expression tree. And I should also point out, because we'll see this later, we can also subclass expression tree to refine the abstraction to do things like instrumented expression tree, synchronized expression tree, in other words, to provide the capabilities for, for changing the service exposed through that common API. 